Hey, creative people. Welcome to another episode of Creativity Quest. I have an awesome surprise for you today. We have Barbara Claypole White is going to be here to have a conversation about creativity and how she found the courage to write the book that she really wanted to write instead of the one that logically made sense in a publishing way. She's going to be right here. And before I introduce her, I just want to invite you really quickly to join me and some other awesome writers in a group called the League of Legendary Writers. What is the League? It is a Facebook membership group where we come together for support, accountability, creative fun, motivation. Every week we have a ball, uh, write-ins where we come together online virtually and write together. Not a lot of talking, just a lot of writing gets done, support, encouragement, all of those things. How can you join? You can go check it out at bit.ly backslash you are legendary. That's bit.ly you are legendary or you know just message me and ask me and i'd be happy to tell you all about it so hold on here comes barbara claypole white Hey, creative people, Carrie Schaefer here with you again today, and I'm super excited to have a guest with us who is uh, not only just another author, but also a friend of mine and somebody that I adore both her books and her as a human being. So I want to introduce to you Barbara Claypole White. Say hi, Barbara. Hey, creative people. <laughs> So today we, um, we're we going to talk to Barbara. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about her, but I'm going to let her do that too as we go along. She is a very established author who's been writing books for quite a while um, with Lake Union most recently I, for, for quite a while. And then she had an idea. So today we're going to kind of talk about the thing that happens when the idea comes out of the ether and grabs a hold of you and doesn't let you go. Know. And uh, what what you can do about that. So Barbara, do you want to just give us a little bit of background on, you know, I know you were trying to write something else and you sure, know, you know, sure. well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm one of those writers who doesn't find her ideas easily. I have a horribly uh, organic, loosey goosey, messy process. So I'm not one of those authors, you know, who has like 10 hours sleep and posts at eight o'clock on Facebook. Oh, I drank my entire manuscript last, last night. Four, you know, I've every art for every character. I'm not one of those people. Every single one of my novels has grown out of a story seed that was buried in another story. Oh, so, wow. So one, one story, the yeah. seed is in one story. Yeah, and, then yeah. and it, just, it just takes me forever to find the story that I want to write, which means that I'm very slow. I mean, I should be a book a year but I'm technically one every 15 months. And you and I both share a wonderful editor, Jody, who has been very oh. understanding about my process. And the problem, a couple of things happened, okay? So I have written all of my books except for my debut to contract. And then I went off contract, had a lot of family stuff going on. I kind of wanted a break, I was burning out a bit. I went off contract and my agent and everybody else said to me, oh, you're off contract write whatever you want to write. And <laughs> they, I, they I say that, that but they I know. never really and mean it, right? <laughs> that, that kind of crippled me. And, <laughs> and what really happened was that I, when I had just, when I was, um, when I had finished writing The Promise Between Us, so I had just finished the page proofs for The Promise Between Us. And I became obsessed with a secondary character who is the only character in this book whose story is not finished at the end. His name is Jake. So first off, I wrote Jake's story. And my agent has said, oh, yeah, 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 you can do that. Just don't make it a sequel. And of course, I made it a sequel. And I couldn't, so I couldn't figure out how to tell his story. And I had shown it to my husband and my son, who, uh, who always see like early, early sort of drafts of my ideas. They're both very, very good at brainstorming. And um, they both basically handed the outline back to me and said, no. You cannot write that book. It's very dark. It's a sequel. And they both circled independently one sentence about a character. A, a you, can you tell us what that sentence was? I'm actually really curious. Do you it have was, it memorized? Yes. Or? It was something about, um, 
uh, I can't remember at that point the character's name, but she's now Maggie King. Um, was something the effect of um, Maggie knew, what was it? Maggie knew enough, uh, something about she knew enough mindfulness to, uh, to plug up all the drains in Durham, but it, but it never helped her. It wasn't that, it was something like that. Something it was like basically that. someone who you, you know is sort of, you think she's going to be calm and has a life under control. And she knows mindfulness and relaxation, but it, you know, it doesn't work for her. It doesn't she's, work for her. <laughs> and, it was, and it was just a sentence kind of about that. And then at the same time, I thought, well, I'm off contracts. I am going to try a new process. And this is when you and I were, were working together at the retreat and then I was banging my head trying yeah. to process because I thought, well, if I can get a better process, because I have this horrible, messy process where my ideas are never obvious and I can only ever do one story at a time, this will make me more productive and I can, I can be a more productive writer and everyone will be happy. And of course, what this process did was tied me in knots because yeah. I, couldn't, I had lost my process. So I was trying so hard. I spent a year trying to my, write a manuscript to a specific kind of process that just every day felt like I was sticking pins in my eyeballs <laughs> and, and I just couldn't do it. And, and what I realized, I kind of had this, I very slowly over a couple of months had this epiphany when everything started unraveling. I basically was stalling out in the second draft. I tried to pitch the story idea to my agent. I couldn't do it. I tried to pitch the story idea to my editor. I couldn't do it. And I started thinking something's not working. Why isn't it working? And, and I realized that I've been trying so hard to follow this process that I hadn't done what I've always done, which is follow the characters. I was trying to make everything fit the process. And, and it just, it, it, was, it was horrible because I can't outline. I'm not that kind of a person. Um, and so the, as I, you know, our lovely editor very graciously agreed to brainstorm with me. And as I was brainstorming with her, I just suddenly, I just kind of suddenly realized what the problem was, that in actual fact, I had two separate stories that I was trying to weld together. Right. And when I pulled them apart, I had two really good stories that I, that I liked and that I was excited to write. But then I couldn't kind of figure out which one to write next. Um, <laughs> because I knew my editor was really excited about one of them. And in, that was a more serious idea. And it's a story about three generations of women and addiction. And addiction is something that, that I, I know about from, from uh, family experience. And I also knew I wasn't ready to write that book. I didn't think I could do it. I mean, I've written two emotionally exhausting books back to back. Right. Family and Promise Between Us. And I knew I couldn't do it. But then there was this other idea, and I kept referring to it as my fun idea, the gin club. And um, because I had created this hero, I'm called uh, Luca Hayward, and he, uh, he was meant to be the hero of the manuscript I abandoned. Uh, but he and the heroine never gelled, even though he was meant to be the love interest. And he was trying to save the family farm in Orange County, North Carolina, where I live, um, by basically um, opening a distillery. He was trying to create, um, um, you know, a uh, what they call a, um, a glass to, what is it, a grain to glass distillery. And sort of trying to make his distillery into a destination spot. So he was about agritourism and everything. And um, I was just kind of intrigued by this idea because he's using local botanicals and I'm a big gardener, I'm a big gin drinker, I'm a big country girl. And so I was kind of playing around with this idea and then I was taking to my husband to the airport and I dropped him off and I said, I don't know which one, should I follow Luca's story? Should I follow Maggie's story? Which one do I go with? And he said, well, you should you should do the gin story call it the gin club and bring back all your old heroes and i went oh, oh man because in addition to always wanting to write jake's the sequel to jake i have always 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 wanted to write more james neely who is my first ever hero from the unfinished garden he is the love of my literary life and i could never figure out how to write his story without writing a sequel and then I started work on the gin. Well, I, I went back and forth between both manuscripts. I don't know what to do. Do I do what my heart says, what I want to do? Do I do what the, the smart career move is? Nobody would be stupid enough to write a manuscript 
off contract with all male point of views when she's meant to write women's fiction and bring back characters from books across two imprints, one of which is going out of print. So none of it made sense, but it was in, it was just saying, oh, you know, there's something in my heart just pulling at this because it was everything, I, you know, once I sat down to write it, I realized that I was doing, I was actually writing the novel I really wanted to write but it kind of grew out of Luca's story. And then I had to spend a lot of time really fleshing out Luca and making sure that the story belonged to him and his teenage son, not these guys who are really strong characters in my head. But so, so, so you have a lot of strong characters that are all wanting to show up on the page. I have a lot of strong characters that are all wanting to show up. And the interesting thing is when I get them on the page, it's just hysterical, it's so much fun because I know these guys so well, you know, I've lived with them for so many years especially James who and the thing is that it was kind of an accident because originally I thought well I'll just bring back James and then uh, they, they just sort of appeared they, they were just like appearing on the page and I thought and you, you would think that that would be really easy right to to use secondary characters who've appeared in other novels of yours but it actually wasn't it was it was actually much harder than I thought it would be and what is intriguing to me is every time I get them on the page just seeing the different reactions because they just sort of take off and they, I, I, you know, like two of them are sparking against each other and I was thinking, right. oh, where is that coming from? And I can, I can see that it would be actually very difficult because you're bringing fully developed characters together and it's like bringing a whole room full of people together. Like they're not all going to get along and you no. can't no. And you it's, can't and manage it's, them or coordinate right. them or, and, know, it's, and it's just them. fascinating. And the thing is that, you know, when I, when I first, you know, when I was first having my crisis about which story to write, and um, I decided to put all everything aside for two weeks because we were going on vacation. And during that time, I emptied my brain, except for one day in the ocean, I had a conversation with my son. And he said, have you decided which one to write yet? And I said, no. And he said, well, you know, I think you're doing the gin club a disservice. You keep referring to it as your fun book. And he said, I, I think you, you know, you're not, um, you're not really allowing yourself to follow that thought. And I, I went, maybe, and then forgot about it. And we got home and I was driving to the supermarket the next day. And I'm driving along, listening to the Pet Shop Boys on my iPod. And this opening line drops into my head. And it's, Luca Hayward had a groundhog problem. And he, I thought, sorry, he had a, I didn't hear you clearly. A Luca? groundhog problem. <laughs> Luca Hayward had a groundhog problem. And I thought, that's it. I'm going to write Luca. And um, I love it. So, yeah, I mean, so it's, it's I, you know, I, I feel I, I, I'm so protective of this book. And I, I didn't want anyone to know for a long time that I was working on it. And I didn't want to talk about it. And I don't want to show it to anyone, even though I'm now a third of the way into the third draft. And so when I finish the third draft, it will go to my three beta readers. And then I'll do another draft and then it will go to my agent and we'll see whether she thinks it's absolute crap and I've lost my mind. <laughs> but, the thing, but the interesting thing is that um, it's really, it's really teaching me a whole nother level of writing too, because I have to really think about body language, to, to, to think about the way these guys interact. And because they're guys, there's not going to be lots of interior monologue. It's, right. it's, it's going to all depend on, it depends on dialogue and, and action and body language. Right. So, and that's kind of cool to me. So it's, so it's a whole new, um, I have so many things here. I've been taking notes as we go along. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I, I can talk, right? You know this about me. I do. I want to backtrack just a little bit and talk about that creative process bit because that, that's something really important and that I talk about a lot and I write about it and I work with it, my clients. Um, I really, really believe that we all have a unique creative process. Yes. And that we get in a lot of trouble when we start to try and stray from that. Mm -hmm. And there's so much pressure out there mm -hmm. that your process isn't right and somebody else's is better. Mm -hmm. And you should try this, you know, other. And I, I think the other thing, too, is that each book has its own rhythm and its own voice. And you have to honor that and, and, and work on it in a way that makes sense to you. 
Right. And that, that's really wise and also um, profoundly true. I believe that because, you know, if you write one book, you think, oh, this should be easier now, right? <laughs> you start the next one and it's a completely different animal. It wants different things and requires different things of you. So that adaptability and being willing to trust yourself and the story, I feel like is like essential. <laughs> I mean, that's the one thing that I learned from this horrible trip down the rabbit hole with a manuscript I abandoned, which is that I have to trust my process. I wouldn't wish my process on anyone, but it works for me. Right. And Mine I, is similar, by the way. It, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, um, and I do, you know, I did, even though I can't outline, I did have to, I did have to learn to rein myself in to be on contract. And so I do write to movie beats. Right. I do at some point create a storyboard. I mean, there's, there's well, well, do you want to show us your storyboard? Actually, yeah, just like, kind of we don't have to show the whole thing, but just so. Uh, this, is, oh, this is kind of just a, oh. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> That's the gin club. See, it's done in four acts. One, two, three, four. Uh -huh. um, and it's written to all, you know, I've got my opening scene, my catalyst, my break into two moments, uh, the B story, fun and games, um, you know, all the classic movie beats from Save the Cat. I love Save the Cat. Save the Cat works for you. I, I use, um, it's a little bit, it's similar to Save the Cat, it's a little bit different. I have a method I got from James Scott Bell um, yeah. that he called the 12 essential scenes. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. And then I just know that I, and he took it from movies. So it's a lot the same. Well, and I think, you know, I actually don't, what, what I've learned about myself too, is that, you know, I'm not someone who does anything neatly. You know, I don't, I don't research and write, you know, or, or research outline, write. It, it's all kind of a, a, a glorious cauldron for the first draft. I but love cauldron. I'm, I'm writing and researching all the time. And, I have, my stories really do grow out of my research. This is why I can't, I find it very hard to, I don't have, you know, a backup well of stories. My well is always empty. When I'm working on a story, that is all that's in my head. There is nothing else. You know, it's really hard for me to even, even begin to work on another story until the page proofs from the book I'm working on are done. As I just say, it's kind of like I have to detox from the characters. Mm -hmm. So I really need to kind of go down the rabbit hole. And one of the ways I do this is I do these one-on-one -on -one interviews with people who are living the experiences I want to write about. And I just follow their leads. I mean, I let them talk at me. I mean, I, interview, I have interviewed so many local distillers, um, you know, about the process of making gin. And then I was, I was out at a farm um, a, a few months ago, a few weeks ago, and someone mentioned foraging. And I'd never heard of foraging before. So then I, then I connect with a, a local foraging company, this wonderful group called Piedmont Picnic, and they took me foraging. How fun! Oh, and I ate juniper berries. I ate North Carolina juniper berries and the tips of loblobby pines for supper. I thought they were supposed to kill you. I thought juniper berries could kill you. Uh, on bush on shrubs on on shrubs or bushes in North Carolina, but on trees, no. Okay. Pretty good. I've I've actually got a vase of juniper berries in my kitchen right now that came back from my foraging trip. That is so fun. So that's so how I find the stories. I mean, I you know, it's it's I might I do have the idea and the kind of and then it's gut. It's oh my gut goes. You know what? I need to know more about that. And it might only end up being a line in the manuscript. You know, which botanicals does, which North Carolina botanicals does Luca use in his gin? It might be that simple, but I, I need to know. And it's like, it's like, no, it's like building the framework of a house. You only right. see, right, the wallpaper, but you've, you've got to know the structure and the drywall and everything's there. Right, and it helps you get um, grounded in the character. I, the other thing was, um, when you talked about it was your fun idea and you didn't know you should pursue it because it was a fun idea. Oh. I think we're, we're crazy like that as writers. It's like we have this built in, we must suffer for our art thing. Yeah. From, you know, the starving writers, all that kind of thing. And so we sometimes do resist what would be easy, what would be fun. And sometimes, well, not, not, not that yours is easy, but it's 
I guess easy for me means something that I'm really into. Like if I'm passionate about it, I don't care how hard I have to work. It's fine. What's right. difficult is that sitting down, making yourself to write, chaining yourself to the desk every day because you're not into what you're writing, right? Right. And that's, I mean, the, and the thing is too, I had, you know, because I felt like I was taking a break and kind of pulling out, pulling back a bit more. Um, you know, there were lots of discussions about, um, that I was a part of about, why The Perfect Sun did so well, you know, my, my bestseller, and why Echoes of Family, which came out after it, didn't do so well. And well, maybe people weren't so interested in stories about the impact of mental illness on family. Maybe I should go, families, maybe I should go a bit lighter. Maybe I should sort of rebrand myself a little bit. And, you know, and I thought about it all and I went, no, that's what I do. I write about the impact of mental illness on families. So, this one's a bit different because this is really more about finding your tribe and it's about men's mental health. Right. Um, and there is a teen boy in there who's, who has crippling social anxiety and has been bullied. So there is a serious side of it, a very serious side of it. And, um, you know, all my heroes are just messed up middle-aged men. And, uh, you know, and I, I kind of love that. So I feel like it is still, even though it's funner, you know, it definitely is fun. I mean, you know, I'm cracking up. I, I, the, the thing is, you know, I'm actually really drawn to dark humor, but I don't think that always comes across in all my books because some of it just doesn't. So sometimes when you talk about mental illness, you can't find humor no matter, you know, how much it's therapeutic, right? Well, although you, you do a brilliant job of that. I, yeah, I, I feel you. like, like I, I get your humor. <laughs> like, yeah, my humor's a little off the wall. So I, you know, there is more, there is more humor in it, more obvious humor in this, but there still is, there's still are dark undertones, and right. it's, it's very much a kind of buddy book. I, I think of it as sort of like a cross between, um, you know, that that movie, The Book Club, or was it uh -huh. just Book Club with the Women? I kind of think of it a little, it's a little bit like a male version of Book Club, but with a pretty serious mental illness thread underneath <laughs> right right well and i definitely want to read this the, the other thing i have to say is how much i i really i want to honor your courage in making that choice i think you know it's it's a thing um I, another thing i'm always talking about writing is writing and it's an art publishing is publishing it's a business yeah. And where those two things come together, it, it can be a very difficult place. You know, where are we going to sell out what we really want to write in order to be able to make some money? Because it's good to make money. It's <laughs> you know? very good to make money, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's good, good to have work. readers. So so there's that, that conflict that, that comes up right there. And, you know, I think that having the courage to make the choice to write the book, the idea that is really talking to you, the one that's really calling you. Have you read Big Magic? Is that, no. if you have not. I resisted that book really weirdly for a year. Everybody kept telling me you need to read Big Magic. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's another book about writing. And then I picked it up and read it on the plane. And I was messaging all my friends. It's like, why didn't you tell me about this book? It's oh, right. it's Big Magic. Yeah, by Elizabeth Gilbert. Actually, I have, I have a copy. I'm writing it down. I'm going to show everybody because I, I am really a fan of this book. So it doesn't want to show up because my it's too much brightness in my um, window. Here. Create, creative Magic living. by Elizabeth Gilbert. She talks about ideas and really kind of as she believes that they're they're alive and they come to us from wherever or they're looking for the receptive ground, the person that's willing to accept them and an idea will come to you and go, hey, and there, there's a point where you make a contract with that idea and decide to go for it. And if you don't, you often will lose that energy or it will go to somebody else. And so, you know, I think it feels wonderful to to go ahead and go for the idea on it, you know, when it's your idea, it, it's almost like a collaboration and then energy grows from there. It's like, I'm trying to think of it, who has, it's, it's a similar idea and it's, it's bugging me because I can't remember who it was, but a very famous author talked about, you know, stories that were out there waiting for you, yeah. you know, they were just like waiting for you to find them and tell them and, right. um, yeah, and I, you know, the thing is that, I've, I'm extraordinarily proud of all my books. And I think at the end of the day, that's what really matters to me. You know, some have sold better than others, but I'm still very proud of what I've done. And I, and I, but the other, but the flip side is too, you know, it, it, I can, I can do this because I have a, a supportive spouse. I am not the breadwinner. 
Great. I work full time at this, but I'm not the breadwinner. Um, and that's a luxury that a lot of people don't have. Don't have, exactly. Um, and, you know, if, if I didn't have that luxury, I would have had to work harder to rein my prices. <laughs> Although, you know, I, I also believe, it, I kind of, I figured this out in um, college, actually, because I would get, you know, those writing assignments in my English degree when I finally got around to doing the English degree. And um, I, I would have the assignment and I'd look at it and I'd go, okay, I know this is what they want me to do over here. But what I really, really, really want to write is over here. And I would look at it and I'd go, all right, I'm going to forego my A because I want to write this thing over here instead. Oh, oh. Almost inevitably when I did that, I actually got the A because it was original and different. And because you're writing from your heart. Right, exactly. And that's, you know, I was going to say, I mean, the other thing is, you know, the other sort of part of the supportive framework, whatever, um, the tribe, the team, is that, you know, my agent has been incredibly supportive. And, and she, she said to me from the beginning when I went off contract, you're off contract, write the story of your heart, write what you want to write. And, you know, then when I told her, I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to admit to her that I was flipping ideas. And she was so fantastic because she said, Barbara, if you write the story with passion, your readers will read it with passion yeah. and that's you know the story matters to you it'll matter to your reader exactly and i believe that i'm totally excited about about this book um i can't wait to read it it's called the gin club you guys be watching because i actually have one of my little i get a little tingly feelings sometimes about books that i really believe they're going to be something and from when barbara first told me about this book i was like oh you have to write that one that just sounds absolutely brilliant but um, it's amazing how much agony we put ourselves through before we actually say okay you're right you have to give you actually said something to me that i put on my my a sticky on my computer. oh yeah that's right you know, give your was it give yourself permission to something about permission i don't remember yeah. exactly but give yourself permission to follow the idea or follow breadcrumbs or something i can't remember what it was oh yeah it was about breadcrumbs it was following yeah, the I got so many <laughs> notes on here and none of them have seemed to be it so. that's okay so um it's but you know you and i we could talk forever but i need to kind of draw this to a close because our listeners don't probably have forever. So I do want to make sure that we mention what's coming next for you. So Barbara, uh, her next book is going to be The Unfinished Garden. And we don't have a hub date yet, but it will be soon-ish. So it's going to be the audio. I'm putting out the audio book of my debut novel, The Unfinished Oh, novel. that's what you're doing. It's the audio. Oh, now I understand. Yeah. So you're working on the and audio. the hero of this book, James Neely comes back in the gym club. James is actually a very, he doesn't have point of view chapters, but he is a very, very, very important secondary character in the gym club. How cool is that? So the two things are coming together. So this will be coming soon. And you can find Barbara's other books on Amazon. I'm going to post a link for you so you can find it easily. And they're brilliant. You should definitely read them. Um, Barbara Clay Paul White, thank you so much for being here today. I had a great time talking to you. I can't wait to see all this. Happy writing, creative people. <laughs> yeah, go do something creative. Go follow your heart. <laughs>